there is no record of God repeating this command to Eve directly. The Garden of Eden doesn't just represent the beginning of humanity. It is the beginning of our conversation with God. In the beginning, when God created Adam and placed him in the magnificent Garden of Eden, he gave him a command that would have a profound impact on the course of human history. Genesis chapter 2 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. The command was clear and simple, Adam could freely eat from any tree in the garden, except for one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned Adam that if he were to eat from it, he would surely face death. As we delve into the narrative of Genesis, it becomes evident that this command was given specifically to Adam. There is no record of God repeating this command to Eve directly. Instead, it appears that Adam conveyed the command to her, as she seemed aware of the prohibition when the serpent asked her about it. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. However, intriguingly, it seems Adam might have added something to God's original command when communicating it to Eve. God's command was to avoid eating from the tree, but Eve mentioned not only refraining from eating its fruit but also not touching it. This leads to speculation that Adam, out of concern for the consequences of disobeying God, decided to add an extra precaution, emphasizing the importance of not even touching the forbidden fruit. Yet, as the story unfolds, the serpent cunningly twists God's words to sow doubt in Eve's mind, questioning whether God had asked too much of them. This manipulation ultimately led to disobedience and the devastating fall of mankind, introducing sin, death, and suffering into the world. If there's no sin, there's no forgiveness, there's no mercy, there's no grace, there's no compassion. Those are attributes of God that need to be displayed. And so God, while having no responsibility for evil, laying that responsibility at the feet of a rebellious group of angels and human beings, has nonetheless allowed for evil in his plan in order that he might manifest his attributes. But in the captivating Genesis account of the fall, who was to blame for the fall? We know about the pivotal moment when Eve, drawn by curiosity, takes the first bite of the forbidden fruit. Throughout history, this event has sparked debates and misconceptions, leading some to unfairly place the blame for original sin solely on Eve's shoulders. However, it is essential to delve deeper into the biblical context to grasp the true narrative. Though Eve was the first to yield to temptation and eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this alone does not prove her culpability for original sin. On the contrary, one might argue that Adam's awareness of the prohibition and his conscious choice to follow Eve's lead render his sin more significant. The Bible, however, never states that one sin is worse than the others as both faced consequences for their actions. To comprehend the origin of original sin, we must explore other passages from the Old and New Testaments. Adam, as the leader in his marital relationship with Eve, held the crucial responsibility of protecting and providing for their family. His role as the head of the family was evident when God questioned him first after their transgression, emphasizing the leadership role ordained for husbands in marriage. Furthermore, in the New Testament, Adam emerges as the progenitor and representative of all humanity. Verses explicitly state that sin and death entered the world through him, making him the conduit through which these calamities spread. In contrast, Jesus Christ, referred to as the last Adam, represents hope and redemption for humanity. It is noteworthy that, though Eve was the first to sin, the ultimate solution to sin was through her seed, Jesus Christ. This seed, born of a virgin named Mary, paid the price for sin, offering salvation and redemption to all who accept it. In conclusion, scripture clearly attributes the entrance of sin and death into the world to Adam, 
making him responsible for original sin. This intricate account goes beyond simplistic notions of blame, shedding light on the complexities of human nature, choices, and the divine plan for redemption. If um, all human beings are created to enjoy fellowship with God, why God in his omniscience created those beings who that he knew would reject him and thereby be condemned to eternal separation okay. from him. This biblical account raises questions about why God would create beings he knew would disobey him. However, the Bible reveals that God created us with free will, enabling the potential for sin, as we are not mere robots following programmed instructions. It's, it's logically impossible to make people do something freely. So it may sadly be the case that in any world of free creatures, there will always be some who will freely reject God and his every effort to save them. But I take seriously the scriptures that say God wants all persons to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So his plan and his will is universal salvation and he works toward that end. And the fact that universal salvation is not achieved is only because people re freely repudiate God and his every effort to save them. And now, the question arises, why did God prevent Adam from eating from the tree of life after he had sinned? Wouldn't it have been beneficial for Adam to live forever by partaking of this tree? The answer lies in understanding the profound theological implications behind this decision. If God had allowed Adam to eat from the tree of life after sinning, he would have lived forever in a state of estrangement from God, perpetually separated from the divine. This would have posed a significant problem because it would have prevented the possibility of redemption through Jesus Christ. The second Adam. By subjecting humanity to physical death as a result of sin, God paved the way for a future redemption through Christ's sacrificial death on the cross. Save them. It seems to me that God is no less loving for preferring a world in which some people are lost uh, despite God's every effort to, to save them. They have no one to blame but themselves. The narrative of Adam and the Tree of Life holds profound theological significance, underscoring the need for redemption through Jesus Christ due to the curse of sin and death. The fall of mankind, though tragic, set the stage for the glorious hope of future restoration and union with Christ. The story of creation, the fall, and the promise of redemption are central elements of the gospel, reminding us of God's immense love and his plan to bring about ultimate restoration for all believers. The curse of death, while tragic, allowed for the possibility of reconciliation and salvation through the sacrifice of our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Through his death and resurrection, believers would one day be restored and united with God, ushering in a new heaven and a new earth, where death would be no more. Our purpose as human beings is to know God, worship Him, and make Him known, rather than pursuing selfish ambitions. Romans 5 verse 8 emphasizes that God's love extends to us even in our sinful state, long before we reciprocated that love. God could have created us without free will, but that would have denied us the ability to freely love and worship Him. God cherishes our voluntary devotion and wants us to come to Him willingly. Though sin entered the world due to our disobedience, God offered us forgiveness. God's love for us is not distant or indifferent. He actively desires a personal connection with each one of us, for we were created for His glory and purpose. Every aspect of our existence is only possible because of God's creation and continuous support. Therefore, we are called to faithfully serve God in all aspects of our lives as a way of glorifying Him. God's omniscience led Him to know that Adam and Eve would sin, but He still created them out of love and for His glory. We, too, were created for God's glory, and in response, we are called to live lives dedicated to serving Him. Through Jesus' sacrifice, God offers us redemption and a chance to know Him intimately. Our purpose as human beings are to embrace this love, worship God wholeheartedly, and live as a living sacrifice to honor Him, God who is spirit never changes. He placed the desire for eternity in your heart and eternity will only be satisfied when you enter into a relationship with He who is eternal. Make that decision today.